I was married and my husband left me for a younger woman. I was 27. She was 20. But he, he wasn't the kind of fellow who went off and left me with nothing. I don't want to picture him that way. No, no. He left me with a two-year-old and a three-year-old and no way to support them. And uh, I had no college education. I had no real training. Uh, the only thing I had in my favor was that I had never skipped English class. Uh, so I, from Alaska, where we were living, I, I wrote a letter and I sent it to every 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 newspaper, every radio station, and every television station in the United States saying that I knew that I was going to be a very good journalist. I was a little unspecific in how I knew that. Uh, and all I needed was someone to give me a chance. Well, as you can imagine, the silence was deafening. But I got a letter from the Associated Press Bureau in Dallas, Texas. And they said they had tests I could take. And if I wanted to gamble and come to Dallas and take the test, maybe they would hire me. So I went to Dallas. I went to SMU. I got the reading list for Journalism 101. Went to the campus bookstore, bought secondhand copies of the books, checked into Motel 6, set up for 48 hours, read all the books, took the test, and was hired by the Associated Press. Everything is time and timing. And what had happened was, this was at the same time, this was the early 70s, when the federal government had finally said to the broadcast networks and to the newspapers and to everybody else, you have to hire more than blue-eyed white men, period. Your time of doing it on your own is up. You're, you now, we're making you do it. So that's how I got in the door at the AP. Hmm. And I, I loved it. Uh, I, I, you know, I, dreams of running around and yelling, stop the press. And I wanted my nickname to be Flash and I wanted all those things. Uh, we were the test bureau for uh, computers for the Associated Press there in Dallas. We hated them. Uh, so they took away our typewriters you know, to force us to use them. They were really just word processors at that time and not computers. One night, late at night, after finishing writing a story, I think on a about a single car fatality on route, one route or another somewhere, I wrote a long chatty letter to a friend in Alaska. And in the letter, I maligned a Dallas newspaper, the city of Dallas. I'm from Houston. And the bureau chief of the Associated Press in Dallas and I said that a mutual friend was leaving and when she left, I would be the only woman left in the bureau. And if the bureau chief wanted to rid himself of all his discriminatory guilt, he would hire a half black Chicano lesbian who could handle the AP style book. Well, I got my print out of my letter, put it in an envelope, mailed it off to Alaska, went home and went to bed, not realizing that in my glorious stupidity about computers, I had managed to put it on hold in the computer in such a way, the following morning was the Apollo 17 moonshot and the Associated Press had invited all of the managing editors and news directors of every newspaper and television station and radio station in the United States to come to Dallas to see how well their new computer system worked. Well, the liftoff for the Apollo 17 rocket keyed the letter that I wrote, which then went out over the Associated Press A wire, that is the national wire. Well, I was fired. I was, I was fired only because the AP lawyers told him they could not, no matter how good an idea it was, and they all thought it was a dandy idea, have me shot. Uh, but I was fired for cause, and I thought, and there I am in Dallas thinking, I'm never going to work again. I'm a single mother of two children with no one to help me support these kids, and I have screwed myself with everybody in journalism who subscribes to the AP, and that would be every outfit in journalism. And the CBS television station, 
in Houston, Texas. Dick John, who was the news director of KHOU, called me on the phone and he said, boy, you write funny. And I said, boy, I didn't mean to. Uh, and he said, uh, have you ever thought about television? And in my arrogance, I said to this nice man, certainly not. I've seen it. And he said, well, that's too bad because we pay twice what the Associated Press pays. And I said, I think I could learn television. <laughs> and that's how I went to work in television in Houston, Texas. At, in 19, I guess it was 19, early 1973, I knew nothing about television. I knew damn little about journalism, uh, mostly what I'd been able to read over 48 hours and every movie I'd ever seen that I thought was how things worked. But there I was. And they had had a woman, their first woman at KHOU. And that woman was Jessica Savage. And she was wonderfully good at her job and hugely popular in Houston. And here I came along behind her uh, as the number, the second woman that they hired. She had moved on to Philadelphia to anchor at a bigger station. Uh, and I come in and, oh my God, here I am fumbling tape recorders and microphones and things I know nothing about. And and the city councilman or the mayor is looking at me and going, where's Jessica? Where's that cute little thing? And who are you, gal? <laughs> and at that point, I wasn't sure. You know, <laughs> I don't know who I am or what I'm doing. And what I did was, it was the right thing to do. I threw myself on the mercy of the technical people, of the cameramen of the editors. Well, our editors were our camera. We were shooting film still, not videotape. Uh, of, of the sound men and, and the electricians. We, we had large crews then mm -hmm. of, of all the other people. And they taught me, not the other correspondents, because you're never out on the story with another correspondent. Mm -hmm. You were out there with all these other people. And I just, you know, said, I'm an idiot. I know nothing. Help, please teach me. It was the smartest thing I ever did because they did. They absolutely did. And I didn't even know at that time I would learn over the years, the number of people who do what I do, who don't respect the work that those people do. And that's, first of all, in, pra in practical terms, that's a very bad idea. You really don't want to be dismissive to your cameraman because they will teach you. And they were, I discovered that they were so delighted to be asked, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I knew that in order to have any control over my work over the years, I would have to learn about shooting and editing and producing, and that I would have to be my own producer. Otherwise I would always be under the control of someone else being the real reporter and being called producer. I had a wonderful time at KHOU. We were, it was, it was a little like front page. It was, uh, you know, we loved, we loved things where bullets were flying and, 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 you know, we, we listened to police radios at all times and we drove around in our cars with police radios on and, you know, scarcely was a bank robbed that we weren't on the scene as fast as the cop and involved in the high-speed chase. We we really liked high-speed chases and driving on the sidewalks and doing all kinds of inappropriate and dangerous things. There was one cameraman there at KHOU, I remember, who really was never satisfied unless he got a photograph of the bullet head-on, which you know, made most reporters loath to go with him when bullets might be involved in the story. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I would probably still there, be there if it, if it hadn't been for, uh, well, some grisly murders, uh, the National Press Corps and a snake. 
two young men were arrested for killing a man named Dean Carl. And they were arrested for killing him. They, they, they said that they had helped him kill 20 or 30 young, mostly runaway boys. And they offered to show the police the bodies where they were buried all over town. And th they did. And it was almost immediately a national story. And the national press arrived. And, and when the national media, when that when they hit town, uh, they, you know, they got a job to do. They're there to do it. And they're not going to be there very long. So manners are not high on their list. And, and we had a good working relationship with the police department in Houston. They actually showed us their files, the people those of us who worked in, in Houston all the time and were very open with us. And then there came to town Theo Wilson, you know, one of the greatest crime reporters in a, ever. Little woman about this big. And, you know, she was asking questions of the mayor, like, how is it 27? That was the number of bodies fun. Boys from the same neighborhood could disappear and no one notice. Well, he, well, he didn't like being asked questions by a bunch of New Yorkers, a bunch of outsiders at all. Uh, so he got mad at all of us and, and, and cut us all off. But while we were out looking for following these boys, they said that there were a bunch of bodies buried up at Sam Houston Park. So we, we, we drove up there, all of us, one twilight. It was a caravan of cars with the... Uh, you know, Police cars, Houston police, county, Harris County cars, state troopers, Texas Rangers, pretty much the same lineup you had outside the school in Uvalde. Uh, and these guys are all in cars. And then the medium, we're all in cars following. And it's been raining and it's drippy. And we get into the forest and we're going around. We're using the TV lights. The police are using the TV lights. To, and these two young boys are saying, go here, go here, dig here. And they dig, and there'd be five or six bodies down there, kept down with lime. And we got to one place, and it's it's dark and scary and in the woods, and it's drippy. And the state troopers are digging, and they hit. When they hit the rattlesnake, everybody heard it because everybody's quiet during the digging and the sound of the rattlesnake that the rattlesnake made when they hit it was quite loud and at, at that point <laughs> camera lights went one way troopers went one way rangers went one way i remember seeing several harris county cops climbing over the head and shoulders of an ABC crew to get up a tree. It was madness in the woods. That one rattlesnake caused all of this. And I, I don't even know why I tell that story, except that it was such a horrible story. It was such a horror story to have to cover. I thought about leaving journalism. I, I thought about leaving Texas. I thought about leaving everything. But instead, what happened was, as you know, uh, I, w I was the local reporter covering it for WCBS. So not only did they send in a reporter who did the covering, I also was doing a lot of coverage because the story was so widely covered. And all of a sudden, I got a, I got a letter from WCBS in New York saying, uh, would you like to come? up here, be a correspondent. I had another smart answer for that. I said, no, I'm too old. Uh, going to New York is something you do when you're 22, not when not when you're 28, 29. But I they said, well, would you come up for the, for the, you know, over the weekend and let us show you around? So I did. And it, it was nice. They offered me money too, because they had me on the drive into Manhattan at sunset with the city backlit. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I'll try New York. So that's how, that's how I, and, and why I left Texas. I think probably other than that, I, I would have just stayed. I am a native born Texan and I love my state. 
you know, look, it's the, it was the best job in the world. Oh, you, know, you had a whole bunch of guys who wanted to pat you on your pretty little head or other less appropriate places and felt free to do so. Uh, most of all, though, it was it was the 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 clear freedom they felt to tell stories, dirty jokes. And, and and stories where women were the butt of jokes. Uh, you know, my old lady stories, my wife's, and, and, and saw, it was as though we were wallpaper. And we were expected, it was almost a test. You were expected to show you could be one of the guys and not let that bother you, mm -hmm. uh, to be let in the club. And now I realize we should have smacked half of them across the face when they did that stuff. Uh, but, you know, some of them were really nice guys who taught me a lot and didn't know any better. So they all should have known better. They all should have known better, but we should have known better too. We didn't, the biggest mistake that women made when we first got in the business was that we had been so told by by so many males that you know there's only room for one of you and so you're all in competition with one another that we thought we were supposed to be almost immediately women discovered that we were our best allies and that with by working together and and working with each other and for each other was the only way to do this it was either going to hang separately or hang together uh but the myth that women are always in competition with one another persisted for years, though it was certainly not true. Uh, it, it, it was women, and particularly as I went along, we, we all learn that we all stand on the shoulders of women who went before us. I stand on the shoulders of women who were in the civil rights movement and women who were in the women's movement of the early late 60s and early 70s those women who marched for my rights i stand on their shoulders and the first women that came into my business i'm not i'm among that first wave in television news but i'm not the first there were others before me and they had it harder and the women that have come after me some of them stand on my shoulders or the shoulders of Connie Chung, or the shoulders of Jessica Savage, or the shoulders of Koki Roberts, or the shoulders of Rachel Maddow. We all owe it, owe something to the women who went before us. And we need to honor that debt. We need to honor it and stop pretending like we invented it. It makes me so mad to see young women on the air who act as as though you know if it's news it's news to me i shouldn't have said that but it's true uh why don't they understand that they are where they are because of women who went before them most of the women in television news had had sort of a driving ambition to be in television news i did not i, I really had no ambition to be in television news. I wanted to be a print reporter. Uh, and it wasn't intentional, but even at the network level, the only other woman I knew who had children was Carol Simpson. But most of the women were like Jessica or Cassie Mackin or Leslie. And they had, you know, I, I remember things like Cassie Mackin wore all white almost all the time. And she had an all white apartment. That's a life that's so unlike my life. You know, I would be rushing home and uh, trying to time everything to get home, to be home when the kids were, were there knowing I wouldn't be, or I'd take, you know, the night shifts, I'd do this and that and the other uh, to be with my kids. Yet, you know, if you are a working mother, it comes with a load of guilt that you're not gonna escape because the, the, the problem in life is not that life is, is too short. The problem in life is that we cannot be two places at one time. And that's the simple fact of being a working mother. 
no, you cannot be at the school play and the political convention at the same time. I, I love talking to women about women in our business. And, you know, yes, there were some horror show stories too. And there was an assumption in the beginning that all of us slept our way to the middle, uh, that none of us would have gotten in without shaking our booties or sleeping with a boss or something. And, you know, the thing is, a couple did, but 99% didn't. 99% of us got in and you, yes, you did have to be better and you had to work harder and you had to do more. And you, and, and, and you also, you also had the looks thing hanging over your head. Now, now it hangs over men's head just as much as women's. Uh, but back then it was, uh, oh my God, you know, the number of letters you would get about your hair. Party to the left, party to the right. It's too long. It's too short. It's too, God, dear, my heavenly days. What is all of that about? And then, yes, there were, yes, there were, there were men who tried way inappropriate behavior with all of us. Uh, and for a lot of reasons. And we all have those stories and they're just kind of in the background. The truth is it wasn't, I didn't write about that much in my books because it's just how it was. And I think there was some, ex some acceptance of, that it was always going to be like that. And we were always going to be putting up with crap. Look, it was very clear to me when I was a kid that boys had more fun. Boys had more opportunities. I didn't want to happen to want to be a teacher or a nurse or a, mo or a mommy. Those were not the three. I wanted to have adventures. I wanted to do things. And you look around you, it's very simple. Who got to do things? Boys, not girls. Uh, so penis envy? Yeah, it wasn't actually the penis we envied. It was the power that came with the penis that we envied. The idea that we should be apologetic for wanting our, our equal rights was just stunning to me. Uh, once I caught on to it, once, and, and once, once I realized that there was a word for what I was, it was called feminist. I never looked back. We were doing a story about a, 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 a U-totem. You have to go way back to remember U-totems. They were like 7-Elevens. I was interviewing the cop out there about why he had no crime. He, his job was to watch over that one. And he said, well, he said, you know, the thing is, he said, every few weeks or so, I take my hat off and I start muttering about snakes and I go down on my knees and waving my arms and muttering about snakes. And I said, why on earth would you do that? And he said, because only crazy people would do that. And he said, if people think you're a little crazy and if they're not sure how you might respond, it gives you an advantage. So some of these people like to think I'm a little crazy, let them, let them wonder what I might do in any given situation. It can only be to my benefit. Then it turned out it was, you know, when I never was crazy. I, you know, if, if just not thinking exactly the same or seeing the world the same as everybody else uh, makes you a maverick, well, you know, that's okay. On, only dead fish swim with the stream all the time. I come from a family of storytellers and in my family, it, as many Texans do, you know, people sit around the table and they tell stories and stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. And if you didn't get it in order or couldn't tell a story in a way that people would listen to you, you didn't, you didn't have anything to say at the table. Nobody paid any attention to you. So you learned fairly quickly how to tell a story what the beginning was, what the middle was, what the end was, where to, where was the best place to start? How, how, to, how, to, how, to keep, how to keep your audience going. And also the truth is I really did go to my English classes. I really can parse sentences. You know, I, 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 
And I love words. I just, I, I'm a, look, I am a writer because I am a reader. The, the greatest gift I was ever given was when I was seven years old and my parents took me to the library, the Luskin branch of the public library and got me a library card. And I went every day after school. And I finally, they, they understood that I, I, I really was reading all these books that I was checking out and they gave me permission to check out from the grown up section and, and to check out an unlimited number of books. And my books, my books took me outside myself. I'm an only child, many only children are readers. My books took me outside myself and then they took me everywhere else. Ah. Uh, and and that was that that was everything. That was everything. Then I wanted to go see the world. And I was fortunate enough to have a job that I paid me to go see the world and to meet many of the world's most interesting people. Uh, and to have this front row seat on history. And they paid, not only they paid me, they paid me damn well. I feel like I lived in this golden age of 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 television journalism at least. Uh I am glad I'm not in it today. I think it was much easier then. Uh, we had much less to concentrate on. Yes, ratings were important, but they there was there was that firewall between news and entertainment that existed then that was a stronger wall than it is now. Nobody ever asked us to do promos to promo things and pass them off as news on on shows of that network. Uh, nobody ever asked me to change a line of any copy I wrote as long as I could substantiate that it was true uh, for political reasons or for sponsor reasons or any other reasons. Uh, plus, all I had to concentrate on was the words and the picture and the story. I did not also have to be the cameraman, the sound person. Really, you know, I'll be a one man band. Uh, it, it, it was easier. It was harder. It was harder as a woman in many ways. We were not paid the same. No. Uh, you know, we fought all the battles that you know that women have fought in every field as we have gone into it. Unwelcome by most, but not all. Some men re welcomed us and were wonderful teachers. I didn't know about the Federal Communications Act of 1934. I didn't know that the airwaves belonged to the people of the United States and that the trade-off was in the, in the Communications Act was that it would allow people to make lots of money on the publicly owned airwaves in return for which the networks or the stations had to give back a certain amount of current affairs, news, and you know public interest programming. That was the rent they paid for getting rich on the public airwaves until Ronald Reagan and Cable came along. And both of those helped usher that out the door. But no, I didn't know that. Uh, I, it's just, I, you know, I, 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 I it, it was still, when I went to work in television news, I still couldn't buy a house without my father or a husband signing the note. The want ads in the paper were still help wanted men, help wanted women, and guess which one had the good jobs? Guess which one had the low paying jobs? All of that was still in place. Those laws were changed by the women's movements, by lawsuits, state by state by state, while the federal government began to enforce the laws that were on the books. And the EEOC, for example, Title, Title IX, all of these things began to be enforced suddenly because of the push of the women's movement, which had gotten its push from the civil rights movement. Um, 
And without that, none of that, none of us would have gotten where we were. I don't watch a lot of television news. I read a lot of news. I get up in the morning, I read three or four papers. Uh, I listen to the news on national public radio in the morning. Uh, you know, uh, and then during the day, I'll read several other papers. And if any of those is a story that I need to see picture of, then I turn on the TV. And I can always go find the picture on YouTube or on you know one of the networks that, that I want to see. But I find that I don't watch the evening news anymore. Uh, like most Americans, I mean, that that is a dinosaur. Uh, people people want the news when they want it. Yep. And and that's not necessarily 5.30 or 6.30 in the evening and for half an hour. Uh, that's gone. That's just, it's that is still breathing is amazing. There are two shows uh, that I'm, I'm very proud of having worked on. One was a show called NBC News Overnight. And it aired on NBC, on NBC News, duh, in the early 80s for a couple of years. And it was, I guess the best way to describe it is if you let the inmates run the asylum for a while. Uh, the show had no money. Some people think that in journalism, good news is no news. Not true. News is news without the judgment call. And so it is with pleasure we begin tonight's broadcast with good news. Unemployment in the United States is the lowest it's been in two years. And it was the, uh, the first of the late night shows. It was put on the air simply to combat the fact in 1980, uh, Ted Turner put CNN on the air, and all of a sudden there was news 24 hours a day, and the networks had nothing at all on in the middle of the night. So all three of the networks put on a late night show, uh, and the one that NBC put on was called Overnight. And it was a terrific group of people to work with. They made us all look good. Uh, when we won the DuPont Award, they called it possibly the best written and bet most intelligent news show ever. I'm very proud of that work. I'm very proud of it. What I guess I, I guess I have to say the thing I'm the most proud of is something I never intended to do. Uh, and that is for 25 years, we produced a show called Nick News. It was a documentary show for children. <laughs> is a Nick News special edition. Clearing the air, kids talk to the president about smoking. And now, here is Linda Ellerby. Hello, this program is about smoking and kids. Our guest is President Bill Clinton, who has strong feelings on this subject and some ideas about what to do. I would take a single subject and explain it in that show. It did not cover the news, it tried to explain the news to kids and and along with that to you know some of the things that I believe about news which is that questions are just as important as answers and that there might be more than one right answer to a question and that we are more alike than we are different it's only that our differences are so much easier to define it's basic basic principles that uh, don't believe that a camera can't lie. Nothing lies as easy as a camera. When you point a camera at something, you're pointing it away from much more than you're pointing it at. Uh, you must always keep that in mind. You know, uh, just uh, just basic rules of, of good journalism. Uh, what it was, it was uh, what I wanted. I wasn't trying to raise a, a nation of kid junkies. Oh shit, no, I was much more subversive than that. I wanted to raise a nation of rousy, rowdy citizens uh, and, and a nation that knew what good news was and could, could look at it and say, that's good, that's bad, that's a lie, that's not true. And so it was really just raising kids to, to ask questions, to participate in democracy young, I heard that on 9-11, 500 planes disappeared in the air. I think they might have smuggled bombs into the planes. 
I heard that the terrorists came from Pakistan. I heard that they were from Iraq. They could have been Hindu. I think the terrorists were from Japan. I'm pretty sure that Saddam Hussein was the one who ordered this. I heard some people say they think 9-11 never happened. This is Nick News with Linda Ellerby. What happened? The story of September 11, 2001. Now from New York, here is Linda Ellerby. Why cover 9-11 if for no other reason? Because the first thing you say when you go on the air is that no matter how many times you have seen video of those two buildings being hit by airplanes and falling, no matter how many times you've watched that, please remember it only happened once. And that's an important thing to say to kids because the aggregate of watching it over and over and over mm -hmm. and all the phone calls we were getting, uh, you know, from kids were all about how are the firemen and how how is this and what about this and how are, by now we're bombing Afghanistan, how are the kids in Afghanistan? So we went to Afghanistan and it is okay to say what you think and to ask questions about what is going on. And over and over, that was a lesson we wanted to give that asking and talking about the tough stuff is okay. It's okay. It's how you learn. It's, and, you know, the, then the, of course that can take you down very strange roads as the Clinton impeachment did. Uh, when you have 11 kids on a set and you realize that oral sex is going to come into the the conversation at some point here. And these kids are, the kids are, our core audience was 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We're not, our shows were not for five-year-olds. We were not Sesame Street, nor did we pretend to be. Uh, you, you, you know, and, and then you, and you, with the show, probably the most famous show we ever did was with Magic Johnson uh, when he announced he had AIDS or that he, that he was HIV positive. And we called him and he said he wanted to talk to kids. And we said, Nickelodeon is the place. And we did this show uh, about AIDS. And we did this show in 1991. Hello, this show isn't about basketball. When Magic Johnson went on television and said he was HIV positive, he also said he wanted to help kids know more about AIDS and safer sex. Good. HIV infection is spreading. People in 157 countries have been diagnosed with AIDS and there is no cure. You have a right to know about these things. You have a need to know. Ignorance is not bliss. You don't go to heaven if you die dumb. That's what this show is about. Not being dumb. It's about AIDS, safer sex, and you. I'm Linda Ellerby. These are some kids with questions. And this is Magic Johnson. And on the air, I, I realized that in order to talk about AIDS, I was going to have to talk about safe sex. And on the air, I had a banana and I pulled a rubber down over it. And I said, you know, this banana is a man's penis. This is a rubber. It goes over his penis before he puts it in the woman's vagina. And that is safe sex. And that is how disease is not transmitted. I would never be allowed to do that on the air today. Never. There's been a lot of changes in television and there's a lot of playing to the far right wing within the new normal of news now. Uh, and, and, and yet, and yet that show won every award in the book then. Yeah. And this little girl, she was six years old. And she had to wear a breathing pack on her back. It just looked like a backpack. And she just looked at the camera and she said, we just want to be treated like other kids. We just want to be treated like and tears. She burst into tears. And she, she, at that moment, what she did was she erased the screen b b between her and the viewer. She, it just, it went away. And it, it, it was such a moment. And then magic, you know, 
nobody was reaching for her and I was across the set from her and I was fumbling with my mic to get it off to get my over there get my arms around that child when magic reached out and put his arms around mm. and the show was so straightforward and true that Ted Koppel that night they called and they asked if they could run the entire show on Nightline and they did and that was the only time something like that ever happened. And the show that we did about the Clinton impeachment won the Edward R. Murrow Award for Best Documentary that year. That's not a children's news award. That's no. Best Documentary of the Year Award. So we, I love it today when when people come up to me and say, you know, I grew up watching Dick News. And for that reason, I became a journalism. Or, you know, I grew up watching Nick News, and for that reason, I became a veterinarian. <laughs> we're going to tell a story about we're going we're going to do a story about moving. Moving is 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 big in anyone's life. It's one of the hits. You know, one of the ten things that hits the stressometer. And for a kid, it's even bigger because you have no say in it. And suddenly, your family is moving. And, and so we're going to do a story on, on the hardships of that and the things you're going to face. We're picking, we pick some families. And why are they moving? Well, they're moving because they lost their job. Their families lost their job at the department store. Well, why did the department store close? Well, the department store closed because the base closed. Uh, the army base that was outside the town closed. And therefore, people moved away from the base and the department store. Well, why did the base close? Well, the base closed because the, 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 the Vietnam War was over and they, they just didn't need that base. It had been started during the Vietnam War. Well, okay, so what was the Vietnam War? Well, but then what was the Cold War? And I thought, if, if I'm going to do this story on moving, I have to start by explaining the Cold War. And 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 I did, and we were forever being challenged with things like this in order to tell the story. The biggest complaint kids had about the grown-up news was always that it was a slice of pizza, it was a slice of the pie. And what we tried to do was give them the whole pie or give them enough of the whole pie that they could have some context for the news, putting the news in context. But I retired in December of 2015 because we covered every presidential election uh, for kids. And we covered it as though they were grownups. We covered it real. And there was no way in hell that I could give moral equivalency to Donald Trump. I had lived in New York for all those years. I knew Donald Trump. Most of us did. And I... I could not try. I was not going to try. Or what? I, or was I going to lie to kids? So I quit. It's just how the world was. It's how it was. My mother took care of all of the check writing and the check balancing and the keeping of the books in our house. Okay. And the day after my father died, they canceled all her credit cards, uh, closed the bank account, everything, because it was all in my father's name. And she had no credit. She had nothing. Uh, and that's just how the world was. And I, I didn't know that I, I didn't know that, that there were other ways other than being a little different myself, uh, being my way. Uh, and if that made me different, that was okay. I had I had a father and, and a and a grand a grandmother who both taught me that different was fine. My mother was not so big on different, but but, but they did. They they taught me that different was fine. Look, I went to church. I went to church camp. I went I I went to Bible study. I sang in the junior choir. I, I was part of the fellowship of the youth movement. I went to Sunday school. I did all of this. 
And the first song I ever was taught was Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world, yet only the white ones were allowed in my church. Mm. And at age 12, I looked around and said, your walk doesn't match your talk. I'm out of here. This is, I believe this is what is called hypocrisy. Where did I get that? From my library card. From all those books that weren't yet banned. It's the biggest mistake we made as journalists, all of us, all of us was not seeing the system, the systemic and systematic racism around us. And by not continuing to stay on that story and stay on that story, we became part of the problem, not the solution. I, that is my biggest regret that I, I became part of that, that somehow the, the, the problem is I recognized it with AIDS, but I didn't recognize it with racism. I was asked once in the late 90s of why we didn't cover AIDS as much anymore and with the same fervor. And I said, you have to understand that news that is news every day stops being news and becomes fact. We report news, not fact. And now that's an oversimplification, but there's truth in that. And that's what we let happen with racism. Racism that was racism, it was fact every day, stopped being news. And that was a major mistake on our part, major. We'll pay for it for a long time for that mistake. Half the time I think that my entire career was a failure for the simple thing of not taking that one story and spending my life covering it. Watch what you say. Learn what is offensive. Learn what the microaggressions are. This goes not just to women. It goes to people of all color, all, all races, all genders. It's, we're now at the place where it's the microaggressions. I mean, that, that just eat away at you. I'm very involved in a girls school that some of us started in, in Mexico, uh, most girls drop out by 15 and, and are pregnant and or married. Uh, boys are encouraged to stay in. Public school only pays up to high school. It doesn't pay for high school. Uh, mm -hmm. So we started a, a school for poor girls uh, who couldn't afford high school that is all about teaching you about choices and teaching you to be financially sustainable and and nothing costs, it's completely free. And it's about giving girls an education that is equal to boys, but mainly giving them the confidence that they are equal to boys. I have a lot of faith in the, the very young, in, in the 18 year olds, the 19, the 20 year olds right now, the 21 year olds, these are the people, that generation, are the ones that have led us into the street after George Floyd's murder, have led us into the street after Roe v. Wade. These are the ones who say, I want to see the truth, I want to hear the truth, and I want better choices. You know, look, it's the, it was the best job in the world. Mm -hmm.